This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you by the Friends of the Magic Word. Those are the ones who, through their financial donations and pledges, keep this podcast going week after week and month after month and year after year. And in particular, I want to welcome Megs Rangel, Michael Mode, and Orlando Ferrer. Thank you guys very much for your financial donations to help keep this podcast going. You are now friends of the Magic Word, and I sincerely appreciate your donations. We are heading into our... 11th year. Actually, we're heading into our 12th year. We just completed, or we're about to complete our 11th year of this podcast, nearing 700 episodes. If you haven't had a chance to listen to all of them, you can go back into the archives and just do a search for just about anybody in magic and you can find them. As I said, I want to thank all the friends of the Magic Word for their donations. I thank all of you who have not yet joined the Friends of the Magic Word, and I say yet because I expect soon you will. I appreciate all those who have given their financial backing to this podcast because uh, during the past couple years we have had some people due to unfortunate financial circumstances have had to either reduce or delete their pledges and so uh, or may have had an intent to donate but then change their mind uh, just due to circumstances. If you find yourself in a financial situation in which that you can assist the Magic Word podcast we would be greatly appreciative of your support. If you go to the magicwordpodcast.com there you'll find a link or a little tab that will say become a friend of the magic word and you can get more information uh, there on how that you can donate through patreon.com or through paypal you can give a monthly pledge or one-time donation also there's a short video of a much younger scott wells there uh, telling you uh, and appealing to you why it is that we need these funds from you and even though i'm much younger in that video the information that i discuss there is no less important then as it is now and that's exactly what we do with your funds is again helping to defray our many expenses that are associated with producing this podcast well enough of that about that thank you again for or considering becoming a friend of the magic word. Well, this week we are going to take you to Austin, Texas, where we were at the recent Collectors Expo, Magic Collectors Expo, that was hosted by Bill Smith. And it was just a, a wonderful weekend. And while there, there were just a, a plethora of so many magicians I wanted to sit down and talk with. And I did get a couple, some of which we will be hearing in future weeks. But uh, this week we talk with someone who is going to complete the triumvirate, if you will. <laughs> Malcolm Puckering, or Puck for short, is someone who has been working for a long number of years in magic and got his start really working with Denny and Lee, of uh, Denny Haney, uh, and other people who worked with him was Alain New and Scott Alexander. And so that's why I say I'm completing the triumvirate because those three gentlemen, that is Scott, Alain, and Puck, were the three who worked most closely with Denny and Lee and toured with them. And so we talk about that here on the podcast. I have had episodes with both Scott Alexander and Alon New here on the Magic Word Podcast. And in fact, I have a video that shows Denny Haney on one of my TV talk show types of things I do at Magic Conventions because now you see it with Scott Wells. If you just do a search on the website for the Magic Word Podcast for Denny Haney, you should be able to find that video, which was taken at the MAES convention several years ago. I really don't want to spoil too much of this because I think you will enjoy our conversation as we get to know Puck this week on The Magic Word. We're going to be going on a different voyage today because typically I have conversations with people who have been friends of mine for many years that I have been associated, worked with, uh, for whatever reason have, have known personally for a long time. And today I'm going to get to know someone along with you. So <laughs> as opposed to my usual style of conversation, it's going to be kind of a get to know each other 
uh, what I call the speed date, okay, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking with uh, a fellow who I know a little bit about, and the reason I want to talk with him because of his fascinating background, and that's Malcolm Puckering, who goes by the name of Puck. Hello, Puck. How are you, man? Doing great. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I am so glad that you're here. I know you work over at uh, Monday Night Magic a lot of times, uh, don't you? Because you live in New York? Well, I w- I, I'm originally from New York, but uh, now I live down in Florida. I'm down in Orlando area now, so okay. I don't get back to Monday Night Magic as much as I used to. Is that to. where Scott Alexander is? Isn't he in... Uh, uh, Scott's actually in Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah. Did so, he live in Florida for a while? Uh, uh, he maybe, did. At one point, he worked at Malone's Magic Bar, and he that moved down there for a little bit. But I remember you never worked there, though, did you? No, no. That was before I, I was still living up north. When you're I, really more when of, a, of a stand-up guy, as opposed to in stage, as opposed to close-up. Or um, I, I actually started out as a bird act and a okay. manipulator, and that's all I did for like the first ten years. And then mm-hmm. I got into illusions. I did illusions for a long time, and now I do more. Uh, stand up magic because yeah. it's just uh, it's cheaper to travel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand that. Uh, another reason I wanted to talk with you is because I wanted to complete the triumvirate. I have uh, <laughs> had a conversation with uh, Scott Alexander. I've had one with Alon New and now with you, which all three of you guys were working with Denny Haney and oh, were good yes. buddies and it all in the book and everything. And so uh, that's why I thought it was important that we, <laughs> again, complete that. It's in, uh, yeah, have it gets a full chance. circle. That's, that's right. <laughs> Did you ever actually work with Denny? Oh, yes. Um, Mm -hmm. I was Denny's assistant for about eight years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had just moved to uh, Maryland from New York and uh, was looking for a vanishing birdcage. And I went to a magic shop called Barry's Magic Shop out in Wheaton, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And Barry told me that this guy, Denny, had just retired from, you know, his 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 touring show and that he put together a a, a magic shop in his rehearsal studio and he might have what I needed. So I went down and got the cage from him. We became close friends. And then I you know, audition for a show. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I told you, yeah, eight years with him. Now, he was with Lee, Denny and Lee, when he was touring. Now, he had two or three Lees? Or? Uh, no, he had two. two. His first was his wife, Lee. Yeah. And then... Because he was in Vietnam and met her over... Yes. She was Vietnamese. Yes, she was. Yeah. And then they, they got divorced. And then Denny ended up getting another Vietnamese girl. Her name was Min. And Min took over in place of... They never changed the name. They kept the Denny and Lee. So she played the Lee part. Right. for the rest of his career. So she pretty much was with the show for about 16 years. Did you work with both of them and know them? No, both? I only work with with uh, men. Men, okay. Yes, I, yeah, that I was, was before my time. I was going to say, I wondered how the second one took to being a replacement and doing, or I assume... Well, I mean, the, the funny thing about it was that Lee did the show, but Lee... She didn't think it was, you know, when people laughed, she thought they were laughing at her, so she didn't like comedy in the oh. show. So they did the illusions. They did the act pretty straight. Gotcha. And when he got men in the show, men loved the comedy and loved to have fun, you know, uh-huh. play around. So the show took a whole nother, you know, perspective once once men got with the show. That's when he developed the whole comedy, you know, aspect of the illusions and everything. Was she that much a part of the act in which she would suggest to him, Denny, why don't we do such and such? I think this would play well. Or Yeah, they would come up with ideas. Cause they, I mean, first of all, we drove everywhere. All yeah. the shows were Real far, we'd be in that van up for and down hours. the East Coast, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. East Coast, and sometimes you know we go into the into like the middle Midwest. of the country, mm-hmm. but uh, but we always drove. And when we was in the car, ideas would come up, and then you know mm-hmm. she would bounce things off of him, and vice versa. Funny, and, you know. And then even when Alan when Alan was with the show, he would come up with ideas, and they Alan. would always. I mean, Alan. Oh, Alan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would incorporate <laughs> things together. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So everybody kind of you know added a little bit to the show because he's Vietnamese too. Uh, well. Yes. So I wonder if he yes. speaks. I don't never ask him if he actually speaks Vietnamese. Uh, did they ever talk uh, Vietnamese between um, the two of them? Did you ever hear that? You know what's funny? I never ever heard them speak Vietnamese. And Denny was fluent. Yeah. You know, because he yeah. was an interpreter in, in uh-huh. Vietnam in the war. So uh, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, they never did in front of me. Yeah. No. It, I just it just <laughs> occurred to me that just now. Like, oh, they they both were <laughs> having that. Yeah. Well, he raised background. that. He raised Alan, and you know, Alan right. was a kid when he started with the show, and he. You know, took him on the road, and uh-huh. you know he was, Seems like, like a father to him, it, it, almost yeah, quite like a father figuratively. Figure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so when you had come to the show, Alon was still working there with as well. Or I took over for Alon. Oh, because he was doing what? What he where did he um, go? Uh, <laughs> Denny started managing Alon, and Alon did this whole uh, uh, Asian style act where, like, you know, he did aerial fishing. He did, you know, where did the ducks go? He did a very Asian style uh, uh, show, and he got him booked into the showboat in Atlantic City. Hmm. And it was an extended run, so he needed somebody to take over for him. So yeah. that's when I went in and auditioned for the show. Yeah. Now, when you say audition, how did you find <laughs> out about the show? There was a kid named uh, Rahan Jackson. He used to actually work for Rich Block for Collectors Workshop. Oh, okay. And we became friends. And he heard that Denny needed an assistant. So he called me and said he wanted a job, but he didn't have a car. 
hmm. to get to the shop. So <laughs> okay. he said, I should, I should call Denny. So I called Denny and Denny says, ah, come on down to the shop. So I went down to the shop and he took me in the basement and he got his daughter, uh, Dawn and we put her on the sword suspension and he said, he showed me what to do. And we got her on the sword suspension and he says, all right, you got the job. Be back here at five o'clock tomorrow morning. And he taught me the rest of the show on the road, on the right, on the way, just to like the, that. Yeah, on the way to the show. So you really didn't have a rehearsal before the first time you performed. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it was so bad that, that that. Oh my God! The first show. It was. If you ever seen the video that Denny sold, uh, uh, Denny Lot, Denny and Lee live at the Wells Theater. Okay. That was my first show. Oh. When you can, and he introduces me as Malcolm, matter of fact, yeah. in the video, and I did the sword suspension, and he gives me one of the swords to come out as a ninja. Uh-huh. During his song, I'm swinging his sword and I broke the sword, <laughs> and I'm stuck with the handle, and the sword is gone. It just snapped off, yeah. and I'm thinking, "Oh God, I'm so fired the first day." And, <laughs> and he's laughing his behind off because yeah. thank God, I'm thinking I, I broke the you know the gimmick sword, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, you know. And he still did the did the show. And then um, he did, did he leave that, that in later? He wanted to. He oh. wanted to figure out a way to make <laughs> that every time, every single time because yeah, yeah. it was so funny. But uh, another thing he did was the legs table. Yeah. She would bring in the table, and then he would pick it up, and the leg would fall off the first one. Yeah. And I tried to run on stage to help him, and Min was like, "No, what are you doing?" I was like, "No, the table <laughs> broke." Cause I'm so new to magic, you know. I didn't know, and yeah, so it, was, it just went on like that. And you know, I was with the show for six years before I found out how the canvas cover trunk worked. I never knew. You, you know? watched it, but you were still it. fool from the wings. I was part of it, but never knew how the heck they got switched. And you never to asked. Canvas. I never asked. Did he assume you knew or? I I don't I think he knew I didn't know and then and then the person who told me how it worked and really pissed me off was Peter White. Remember Peter White P and A Silks? P and A Silks. Yeah. Peter he he told me the secret and I was like no and then once I knew I was like oh I was so disappointed uh-huh. because well, you know most I loved having the mystery of not knowing how something worked that I was so right. close to you know and then at later years I had to find out how it worked because I ended up doing it <laughs> in the show with Scott and Denny we would do a mm-hmm. triple switch with it okay. Yeah. That would have been funny if you would have at that point saying, well, Denny, I'm sorry to report. I'd like to do this, but I don't know how that works. And he's going to say, what? You've done this for like 15 years. I know. I, I would always see this one little gimmick. I won't say what it is. I yeah. find it in the trunk after the show. I'm like, what is this thing for, you know? And when I find out later, I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah. yeah. That was great. I'm kind of the same way. I remember watching Siegfried and Roy and seeing the stage shows and when – they would descend from the ceiling uh, with a lady and she would disappear and be a tiger or something. I never and still do not want to know certain large illusions that I will never perform. Now, if it's something that I think I want to put in the show or something that I would like to learn, I will seek out the secret. Then at this point in my life, I know most, like with you, most all secrets after yeah. a certain number of years and experience. But still, I love being fooled and I don't like to know the secret for some things that I don't think I'll ever want to do. Or yes. I don't see myself doing tigers, for an example, kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So that's interesting. That was something that you weren't doing at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know, I mean, I knew how, I knew it was a hard trick to do because yeah. there's only a few magicians that actually did it on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I knew it was a hard trick to do. So I was like, nah, I'll do the old sub trunk. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And when you were touring with him, I assume it was some sort of a big van or something that... Uh... Yeah, we had a truck, and then he also had the van. The truck we would take if we did, like, uh, backstage with the magician, like, we had to bring the really mm. big illusions for some of the corporates. But usually everything would pack in the small van, and he had his show made to a certain level where everything flew over the counter. So we were out 70 pounds, so... I could take two pieces, men could take two pieces, and he could check two pieces, and we can check a whole illusion show oh. over the counter. He even had the sub trunk playing down like an eighth of an inch to take enough weight off it so we go wow. over. Wow. Yeah. Try to keep it just within. So. Yeah, he has sword basket, sword suspension, and the and the sub trunk, and we do the full full illusion show. What was your favorite of the illusions? Um, I'd probably say the trunk. Because the trunk just, it killed everything. And Denny had it down on science. I mean, every show, I mean, at least 96% of the time, they would leap to their feet. Not even like a, you no know, one person and another person. Like, they would jump to their feet, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, it was just, it was so well thought out. And the music and everything was just great. 
Did he work a lot with the music to try to get that? I know, like a lot of us, will listen yeah. to different kinds of music, and I, I mean, I had a sub trunk for three years until I found the right music. To yeah. tell you the truth, I mean, I'd rehearse it, I wanted to do it, but mm. I just didn't have the right music. Yeah, he he definitely had played around with different music until he found you know just the perfect music. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I'm so weird. So I, I saw a lecture one time with Jonathan Pendragon talking yeah. about infusing music with uh, with mm-hmm. magic, and a lot of guys find the trick first and then they find music to fit it i'm the opposite hmm. i find music that i love yeah. and i say one day i'm going to find a trick for this and i've done that with at least four pieces of my show interesting that i've had the music for years in my head and then finally i get the trick and i said now i found a marriage for it and you know so i do a little back that's probably the better way of doing it because this way i mean we have investments in something waiting for the music to come yes. as opposed to you have the music and so okay well now i'm gonna you don't have like thousands of dollars invested just sitting there doing nothing until the music comes <laughs> you know what i mean yeah it's true <laughs> and it's and you also have a personal connection to the music because yeah. it's something that you really really enjoy so yeah it yeah might help is there a certain kind of music that you prefer is it jazz or um it's funny i use i'm very collected with my music i use mm. Jazz, I use uh, classical. Classical. I use hip hop. I've used pop. I mean, I've used some obscure styles of music. I mean, my show has people have always commented that the music in my show is very diverse because mm-hmm. it's very different and it's stuff that I really like. You know, and I find a lot of times mu- uh, movie music for movies right. works really well sometimes. Too. Well, I think so too, and it resonates also with people. So when people hear that music, they associate it with a movie. However, if you see it in the context of a magic show, you might forever then after remember that trick yes. as opposed to the movie. Mm-hmm. So they've already, they're already familiar with it, and they're going to hear it more often. And so mm-hmm. uh, that's a good way of doing it. Do you find that your style was really influenced a lot by Danny? Yeah. I mean, uh, to a point where I was emulating him on stage to a mm. point where I had to break away from that funny. and trying to find my own self yeah. because I was just doing Denny on stage, <laughs> you know, and Denny did, did Red, Red, Red Skelton, yeah. you know, because that's who he... Well, you don't he, have any hair. He, <laughs> <laughs> I know that he looked like Grandpa from the Monsters yeah, at the yeah, end of the yeah. show. <laughs> I recall also he was big on the school circuit, doing a lot of colleges, and you yes. were talking about corporate shows also. I assume you did schools with him too. So Yeah, he did. Well, he was really big on the college mark. I, he did NACA convention. I knew mm-hmm. I think he gave you 10 minutes, and he got a standing ovation, and wow. they went back to the booth, and they block booked his whole year. And he was, you know, really big on the college circuit. And that was back when the colleges were paying a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I didn't work colleges with him. I just did the corporates. Oh, he I did? came in towards the end. So it was just him and men? Yes, it's him and men and myself. And we would do the corporates. Well, I mean, as far as the the, the school shows. It was just- oh, the school shows. No, no. He took um, a lot. Oh, he Alain, did then back yeah, then. Yeah, did it. Because I know Alon's done a lot of school shows then as well. So I wonder if he was yeah. kind of influenced and he was kind of in that market, knew about NACA and all that. Could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, could be. Well, Denny, well, Denny managed him when he first started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he managed uh, Alan's you know career in mm-hmm. the very beginning. So yeah, I'm sure he must have had some contacts in the college market. Right, right. Um, and I, that's why I wondered if you had done some of that because I remember Danny telling me when uh, was it? I think maybe when he had the Baltimore shop. I'm trying to remember if it was the Vegas Magic Shop, but I believe it was from Baltimore. But he was lamenting having given up that, as you said, lucrative career, really doing school shows, because he said, I felt like I was at the top of the game, and I wanted to get out, and I thought mm-hmm. the place where there's going to be money are brick-and-mortar magic shops. <laughs> 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 yeah. He said, if I would have known. <laughs> he, yeah. said there, he said that was really the beginning <laughs> still of colleges. They were on the rise, and I thought they had peaked, and I was jumping off and putting money into the brick-and-mortar. Yeah. It's just the opposite directions of <laughs> Yeah, Denny, uh, the college market, I think at one point, too, he he was doing more and more um like he was doing the bullet catch at colleges. I didn't know he did that. Oh yeah. That was a pistol or a rifle? A rifle. No kidding. Yeah, Denny, I mean his and he was he's in the book, I guess the uh, the was it David Ben who mm-hmm. in the book? Yeah, mm-hmm. he put him in the book about one of the people who who toured with that uh with that trick. But he did it and it was I mean it wasn't very dangerous, but still I wouldn't do it. But he said one time he caught a kid um putting like uh, paper clips and all kind of different things in the uh in the muzzle of the rifle in the muzzle the gun barrel yeah so he said after that he said forget it i'm not gonna I'm not gonna risk myself anymore doing wow this. no uh you wouldn't you have to keep your eye on what's going to be going on I, I i know penn and teller do theirs uh which was given to them by banachek a long time ago and they give honor to him and homage but um yeah uh, theirs is 100 percent safe and yeah. banachek's 100 percent mm-hmm. safe yet looks 
to be incredibly dangerous. And it's difficult to have that right kind of mix. It's like smash and stab kind of a thing. Yeah, like Scott's versions are you have to be, you can't hurt yourself. You're an idiot. Yeah, there's no, there's no way you can do <laughs> There's hurt no way possible, you know. <laughs> His so. is brilliant with the broken bottles. The yes. bottle and also the nail. Nailed so, it. Oh, that's right. I yeah, forgot. Both, both versions are completely 100% safe. Right, yeah. right. Every time Scott, I, I don't like to attend Scott Alexander's lectures because I always buy something. <laughs> and not just something. It's like, I'm going to do that. Because I, I can see myself doing this stuff that he's always teaching. It's so darn clever and very funny. And yeah, it very allows commercial. for a lot of, yes, commercial, allows you to put your presentation into it and everything. And so you three guys, are, your styles are different. Uh, with, with Scott being so funny and Alan being doing a lot of mentalism and yes. spoon bending and everything. And then you're doing, would you still do classic doves kind of thing or anymore? I've, or I've with done animals birds or? in a long time. Yeah. But, uh, but, now I, do, I still do a lot of manipulation and mm-hmm. show a lot of classical. So magic when you're working like at Saturday uh, Monday Night Magic in, in New York, what do you do? What kind of, I, mean, I still do dancing handkerchief. Um, uh, I do a hanky panky, which is uh, our version of a 20th century soap mm-hmm. with a uh, with a visual you know uh, thing at the end. Um, I do billiard balls. Still do billiard balls in the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I still do an egg bag now to honor Danny. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do a miser's dream with bubbles. It was a routine we came up called oh. wishes. And stuff. So yeah, a little you do razor blades, needles. A lot of talking, uh, actor. But you do some. I do talking, but I'm not a comedy magician. Mm-hmm. So it's like there's funny moments, or you know, or comments, but nothing like a laugh a minute type of thing. Not, not like all. Scott Alexander's would no, be. No, great. not at all. And much more, much more uh, skilled magic where it's just more knuckle busting. Mm-hmm. You know, magic is just a little bit more, more my style. How much do you practice still? I practice a lot. Okay. I still practice a lot. Like when I'm on a ship and I have to do a show, I'll start practicing that morning for this for the evening show. Mm-hmm. Just uh, just to a point now where I don't even know if I need to practice, but it's more for ritual. Mm-hmm. It just makes me feel more comfortable. Put you in the zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. I understand. Um, and ha- uh, there have been just a few times when the three of you have worked together. And I remember also at Abbott's get together one time when oh. which Denny was there, and you guys had the whole evening show. Oh yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, Scott and I still work together. Matter of fact, we're at the castle in uh, like two weeks. Okay, and uh, we do a show together, and that show is so much fun because you know I get to be the straight guy, and he gets to be the goofy guy, and it just really works, right? You know, and and, and we get to do a lot of the magic that. That we've created. In the palace, not the parlor, I yeah, guess. Yeah, work in the palace, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and by the way, when people are listening to this, we're recording this here on April the 15th, I believe. Oh. And so, I don't know, <laughs> this may have passed by the time I you know, will have yeah. missed uh, uh, Puck. And, and we were at the Magic Castle. <laughs> <laughs> and we killed. <laughs> that's what I'm sticking with. Yes, that's where you go. <laughs> exactly. Uh, do you have a room you prefer? Obviously, you say you don't know little close-ups. I guess you like working yeah. in the palace. So. Yeah, I like that. Like I've, I've only worked at Palace, and uh, I mean... I've been asked to do the close-up room in the parlor room, but I just the reason why I don't want to do it is just because there's no camaraderie for me in that mm-hmm. room. Because in the palace, I get to work with other guys, mm-hmm. but in those rooms you're by yourself. And, right, that's you know, true. So I enjoy you know working with other acts, you mm-hmm. know, in the being palace. backstage and everything. And yes, yeah, yeah. Now you don't attend. Speaking of that, uh, magicians, the conventions like we are recording this right now at the Magic Collectors Expo here in Austin, Texas, and. You don't attend necessarily a lot of conventions, or do you? I haven't seen. I attend a lot. I've not seen I you only, a lot. I've only mostly attended conventions that I'm working, mm-hmm. and I've worked a lot of conventions, you know, throughout my throughout my career in magic. Right. But I usually don't go just for fun. But this was one I really wanted to go to mm-hmm. because it's such a different, you know, style of convention. True. And uh, I went to one one time with Denny in Baltimore. It was a collector's convention, and, and I Had loved it. Had a great it. time. Yeah, yeah, it was just great. It's just, you know, and, and, and then how much, you know, you learn about the history and sure. everything about magic and to see the old props and everything. It's really cool. And the kinds of sessions they have where they talk about history and show yeah. – Films or videos, I mean, or uh, uh, presentations, PowerPoint, or just having people uh, as well. Plus, we have the advantage now in Austin of getting to see Ray Anderson show at Esther's oh, Follies. Oh, my gosh. Talk yes. about that. Did you enjoy oh, that? Oh, wow. Yeah, it was just an experience. <laughs> I'd been hearing about this show for so many years, and I was kind of saying, oh, I hope I'm not going to be disappointed because when they build it up that big yeah. and you see it, you know, and you're like, oh, it was okay, you know. But it was everything that they said it was going to be. I mm-hmm. mean, just the, the use of the room by itself was blew me away how they can use this small space and get so much out of it and and, and have make a window it, behind him yeah and work with a window <laughs> and incorporate the people walking by in the street you yeah. know and it's just it's genius yeah it's very and it's so topical that they must change that show every other month you know oh no every week 
yeah. when they get together. Uh, it's like, what was in the news this week? And yeah. because they're in the state capitol, there are a lot of political things that are happening. Plus, uh, the University of Texas is here. so Full songs and everything just written on the spot. It's amazing. Yep. That's great. Um, and so uh, going back again to Monday Night Magic, uh, circle back to that again mm-hmm. because whenever that you are doing that um i i know they have a lot of people who are coming through it seems like although they do have people from out of town it's only when they're kind of coming and visiting but it seems to have kind of the same group of people so you've performed several times there I yeah I, I started a monday night magic back when they were at the sullivan street playhouse so did I. and I was uh, <laughs> oh my gosh it was great it was great and and i was back then i was a bird act mm-hmm. and and i would drive in the two and a half hours from maryland I'd go in, do the show, and I'd go out to dinner with them, and they'd give yeah. me pointers, and they'd sit down and draw me diagrams on placemats of things I need to work on oh, and really? change. And then, uh, and then I'd drive back yeah. to Maryland. And then I'd come back like the next week and do it again and show the stuff that I had incorporated in the mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. You know, and at the time, I was also working with uh, Vito Lupo, who was one of, my, uh, yeah. one of my teachers. And Vito, when he would sit there and it would, you know, it was a learning experience for me, Monday Night Magic. And that's why, to this day, I give them so much credit because they opened up. The other reason why I got into the Magic Castle the first time was the video that was shot there, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, and just they would really, they really helped me out a lot. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and speaking of Vito Lupo, he, he is not only a creative uh, genius and great uh, performer and everything, but uh, a good teacher as well. I know for a long time he was working as an Imagineer, and he would work with Disney. They would yeah. come in like on Monday mornings or something, mm-hmm. flying in from wherever he was. He was living in Ocala, and he moved to Florida for a little bit. Just yeah. to kind of be closer to that, I yes. guess, or that mm-hmm. kind of a thing. So how did you get connected with Vito? We went to the same high school. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, we went to the same schools, and me, him, guy Glenn Farrington. Glenn mm-hmm. went to the same school with us. Wow. Uh, you know, it was a lot of a lot of uh, really talented people, and I knew of him, and I saw him perform when I was younger. And then I was working at Magic Convention. I think it was MAS. He was there, and, and we started talking and realized we went to the same school and everything. And then, uh, and then I said, I'm looking for somebody to help me, you know. You know, put this act together, and he he volunteered, and it was great. Yeah, we go to the house because he still lived in. He had his house in Baldwin, in New York. So we go to the house, and we would work on stuff. And, I yeah. think he's in Italy now. Is that right? Yeah, he's overseas. Yeah, yeah I was thinking he he, he was. Uh uh, overseas. Uh, and speaking of overseas and talking about some of the cruise ships and things you were doing, was that anything that Denny had helped you with or how did that evolve? Um, the cruise ships, uh, there was a guy named Curtis Carroll. He was a hypnotist and he also was putting together this big illusion show. He came to Denny's shop when he moved from Seattle to Maryland and said he was looking for somebody to help him. Mm-hmm. So Denny talked to, told him about me, you know, that I assisted him. So he basically called me and said, would I be interested in helping him with these illusions? So I mm-hmm. went and helped him out. We became really good friends. And he was a very successful cruise ship entertainer. And he just, by working, without even seeing my act, he said, you want to work on ships? I said, sure. And he called and I went out sight unseen yeah. on Princess Cruises direct just from his, you know, his recommendation. Through an agent? No, just from him on. telling the huh. office, book this guy. And that was it. So the ship paid you directly? Yeah, we got paid direct. We got paid cash back then. Too. <laughs> so after that, did you continue to go back and work on that line, or did you ultimately find an agent? Yeah, stay, I stayed with Princess for a while, and uh, and we weren't. I mean, I was mediocre. I wasn't a great act, you know. So I didn't what work year would a this lot. Have been-ish? This was uh, ninety five. I want to say okay. around ninety five, ninety six. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we we worked sporadically here and there, but I was also working as a waiter full time to pay bills and I would do the ships every once in a while. And then I ended up getting an agent. And mm-hmm. uh, once I got an agent, then I started working more. I started working other lines. Because I've heard it before said that you should not necessarily contact all of the ships if you're interested in working in a ship because if they don't book you or they overlook you or whatever, then you go to an agent. They will ask you, what other ships have you talked to? Because if you say, well, I've talked to Princes and, and all these others, yeah. and then they will say, oh, well, they didn't take you. Then I, do, I don't want to run you by again because they've already said no to you. you know, if somebody else has submitted you too, they don't want right. to double submit you because then uh, the bookers – they don't want to get involved in a war between agents, so they just mm-hmm. say, I'm not even going to use That's this That's why guy. I think it's better if someone is getting ready to work a ship. And things have changed dramatically, obviously, since then. Mm-hmm. And even when I was doing it in the early 2000s, it is so much different now. But I still, I think, would recommend going to an agent rather than trying to book a direct. You know, uh, yeah, I would say an agent. But also right now, a lot of these lines are, are – 
interested in booking direct sometimes. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're a good act, I mean, think about it is that working you're talking about land, post-COVID right now. Yeah, you're talking about, okay. Post-COVID. Mm-hmm. But working on land and working in ships is two different worlds. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the show that you may have on land that works great for you, it might die a thousand deaths on the ship and vice versa. Give an example. And why? Um, because, first of all, the audience doesn't, they're not there for you. They're there for the ship. Mm. They have other things going on. So you have to really get them quick and and you also have to have an act that's going to involve everybody you know the kids and the, and the adults and the old people you know sure. i mean it's just all ages and and also you don't know what their day is like they might be in port really early in the morning and they go on tours they get back on it's a late night show 10 o'clock at night and you know they might They're fall tired. asleep or they might want to walk out you know so i mean it's, it's just uh you know, learning how to work ships it took me a long time to get the formula of a show that actually worked regularly mm-hmm. You know, it took, took, took some time. And when you were out, did you go for two weeks, six weeks at a time? Or When I first started, I would do six weeks at a time. And then when I worked uh, a Lucian show that Scott put together, I was out for 10 weeks at a time. Wow. But now I don't do more than one to two weeks tops. That's because you're not carrying the illusions. Because typically, as I understand, mm-hmm. again, if they're booking an illusion show, they want you to stay out there because they yeah. paid for all that shipping. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And yeah. when I first started, I had uh, like 16 cases. Oh, and I had the illusions. I had my ex-wife. I had a parrot, my cockatoo. I had seven doves, five parakeets, and a house cat. And they were all on the ship with me in my cabin. <laughs> and you had two shows, I guess, right? And A and B shows. You had like what? Yeah, a 30-minute yeah. show and a 15? I had 245. 245, okay. Yeah, 245. Mm-hmm. And it had to be completely different. It's completely different material. And both strong. Yeah. Well, yeah. One strong and and one okay. But once they love you, then you can get away with the bad show. And, 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 I, and also, I learned a long time ago as well that you always open with your best stuff. Yeah. You don't want to say I'm going to save this for the end because they love me. It's like they may not come again. Exactly. I made that mistake one time. Yeah. And I had a comic uh, guy. He's actually he's a Disney actor. Rondell Sheridan saw me working, and I played this video of me on TV and everything in my second show. Yeah. And he was like, No, that should be in the first show because they're not coming back. <laughs> you know. <laughs> grab them you know so yeah it's a, a lesson i had to learn do you like working on, on shore or off or uh on, i mean on sea or what i enjoy sh- i enjoy the audiences on ships because the audiences are usually very enthusiastic especially on i'm mostly on royal caribbean now and they're really good audiences mm-hmm. uh i just don't like being out there for uh lengthy amounts of time that's interesting you say particularly the royal caribbean how does one audience for a cruise for a line differ from a different oh. audience in line is that because of how much they're oh. paying no it's all completely different by by ships uh like i work for oceana which is all very wealthy yeah smaller like ships yes exactly like you know 300 passengers right. and uh they're tough to work for yeah and they've seen everything exactly. hard to impress you yeah. know then holland america they're very old mm-hmm. you know where you know the average age of the guests is 70 you know, 75 years old mm-hmm. and it gets the average age up, is dead and it gets, a, yeah, it gets above <laughs> that. Say, yeah. yeah. So Holland America is a hard line to work. You have to really, I, I worked well there because my show became autobiographical. I started talking more about my life, yeah. my things in my life, you know, my family, my background, things I went through. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, they endeared me almost like a grandchild. And yeah. they like, I stopped getting handshakes and started getting hugs after my show. So I knew I was doing the right thing. Would you not do that in a family show or something for Princess I've, Line? Or? I've done that now. Yeah. Princess is, is – is, and it also has to do with the length of the cruise, hmm. changes the – If it's three-day versus a week or – Three-day cruise, you're going to get young, right. you know, partiers and stuff. And then the longer the cruise, of course, or the destination, you know, if it's exotic destinations and not just the Caribbean or Mexico, then you're going to mm-hmm. get, you know, more wealthier people, mm-hmm. you know, more uh, more versed in, in entertainment. Entertainment, right. Yes, yeah, so – yeah, it's just every line is different. I've worked Carnival and I've worked, you know, Oceana. I've worked Princess, Holland America, NCL, and every single one is completely different. Some lines I do way, you know, way better on than others. Some hmm. lines I don't do well on because it's just not my audience. That's interesting. I really hadn't, I, I don't have that broad of an experience, so I, I never heard that before. That's interesting. Yeah, every line. Huh. Um, you know, I can understand as far as the age groups and, and as far as the economic background on you know certain people and groups uh and maybe perhaps even the, the cultural background uh, like in some places where you have to speak the language you have no, no german i mean english may not be the primary language for an example so yeah it could be a difficult so hmm. yeah i just worked a ship matter of fact two weeks ago and they were all british the ship mm-hmm. was out of barbados and they were all british they got different sense and- of humor 
than Americans. I was dying out there. I was like, oh my God, can I buy a laugh? Can yeah. I buy something? Yeah, it was it was a rough one. So. <laughs> it's almost like their arms are crossed. It's like, uh, fool me, you yeah. know, magic boy. Yeah, it's kind of like they've seen it. Yeah, I think British humor. I've heard that said about some groups even in America. What was Somebody told me a long time ago that about uh, that you can tell if in Minneapolis, when you're doing a show, if there's an audience out there because they cast a shadow, <laughs> because they're not responsive. Yeah. Maybe true or not. I've not worked yeah. that much in Minnesota. <laughs> Some of the best audiences I've ever had are out of Galveston, Texas. No kidding. Galveston. When I go out of Galveston. That's the, the carnival line. But not, no, no. This is on Royal Caribbean. Oh, okay. And phenomenal audiences hmm. out of Galveston. I think it's because it's a lot of Texans and because we I guess Texans just that the attitude or whatever it may be, they're some of the best audiences I've worked for. Uh-huh. Yeah. And when you're working a corporate show, do you find uh, – do you do your same show? Do you customize it for I them? change my show sometimes for corporates. It, yeah. In what way? Um, just some of the material I use is not as uh, – I don't say commercial. It's it's commercial, but not edgy. but more more adult oriented. Oh, you know, more more sophisticated humor for the corporate audience. For the corporate audience, gotcha. than okay. I went on a cruise show. Okay, and yeah. when you say adult, you don't mean like X rated. You're talking no, about not X rated, but, but like just not family kind just, of a thing. Yeah, just more uh, for par- uh, age appropriate. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Right, right, right. I just wondered whether that you actually try to incorporate more things where, let's say, with. Exxon or IBM or somebody where you try to incorporate. Well, I try like sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes I will. You know, uh, try to incorporate some kind of messaging. Mm-hmm. You know, for them, especially if they ask me to. Right. You know, ahead of time. And so, what is your, what are your thoughts about scripting? Um, I I'm a hundred percent scripted. Okay. I mean, I have enough ad libs where I can you know go off a little bit, but I stay pretty tight to my script. That's right. When I work with Scott, it's always like, oh my god, what's he going to do next? That's why I was wondering. <laughs> every show to Scott is different, right? And and I'm always tight, so our shows can go really long sometimes mm-hmm. when he gets when he gets on a rant, you know, he's going on and stuff. <laughs> but it uh, keeps me on my, on my toes. Yeah, definitely keeps me on my toes. So. Uh, right, right. Um, and you have lectured before. I, you have a lecture you yes. do. I know I went to attend that some time ago. What is it that you prefer to teach? What do you talk about? Um, I mean, we talk about just, you know, um, performing for stand-up, you know, as a stand-up magician, stand-up crowds, mm-hmm. uh, and a, a lot of the just the routines that, that we've come up with and, you know, how we develop the ideas that we come up with for tricks because it's always like a really lengthy process before it actually gets to What is your process? Point. Um, first of all, I do a lot of research to see what's been done before mm. and, um, go back in the old books. I find a lot of stuff in the old books that, that are great ideas, but not practical or they, or they were written about an effect that never was really done. And I figure out ways to make it actually happen. And me and Scott will bang our heads and then we'll start talking to some builders and people of that nature and say, Hey, can this be done? And uh, and then we got to take the prototypes out and test them and test them and test them and work out all the bugs and mm-hmm. and then come up. You know, Scott's really good at at, at the pattern, putting together presentations yeah. for it. And I do more of the technical mm-hmm. portions and stuff. Do you build? Do you know much about woodworking and? Not really. Yeah, Scott does a do little bit, with, a little bit, but Danny. no. But I do sewing and things of that nature. Anything mm-hmm. like that, I can put together. But we have builders for a lot of stuff that we do. And so when you're coming up with an idea or something, you're trying to put your own little twist on it. Just like you were talking about Miser's Dream of having bubbles instead of coins. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we wanted to do something that was uh, that had the feeling of snow, mm-hmm. but not snow because everybody and their mother was doing snow at the time. And mm-hmm. we wanted to do something different. So came up with this idea of doing a Miser's Dream, but with bubbles. And at the end, have the shower of bubbles come out of the out of the uh, the pail. Right. So that way you can get the whole grand. And, 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 and we made the story very personal, too. Like I talked about, you know, my family, my daughter and stuff. And uh, and I found the music, I, the music I'd always wanted to use, I mm-hmm. found a place for it in that trick. Wow. It just like came to you. Yeah. You? Well, I, I always wanted to use uh, Pure Imagination, Willy Wonka. Oh, yeah. For like 10 years. Love and I was song. like, oh, and I said, this is going to work great for this trick. And it, and it did. When you use music that is ASCAP, do you have to pay for that? Or how? Not on the ships. The ships, they, they, they do a royalty. Like the castle does like a thing with BMI and ASCAP. But mm-hmm. if I want to go on television. That's, that's what I was going to say. Have you ever worked uh, Masters of Illusion? I'm not Masters. I've done AGT. I've done, I've done Fool Us. And, and it's it won't let you use no well the funny thing with AGT is uh, the music I had to submit three different songs hmm. and they got permission for one but the one I really wanted they hadn't had permission for it yet and they said well practice was all three and we'll let you know 
right? You know, Which when we get, we get permission. And I was doing a live show. Mm -hmm. They told me five minutes before I walked on stage for live television what song I would be using. Oh, my gosh. And me and Scott just looked at each other. <laughs> wow. And I was like, I wonder if they did this just to make me nervous, to make me look, you know, <laughs> you know, more intense. But it scared yeah. the crap out of me. But, yeah, but thank God I had you practiced with all three really well. What was your experience like on that, on AGT? Oh, I mean, it was great. I mean, they – you know, they treated me well until I lost. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, yesterday's news. Once I lost, they were like, ah, they hit, me, hit, me, hit me with the boot, and I was gone. And that uh -huh. was it. But when I was doing well, they, was, they were putting everything behind me. So, Did you advance yeah. how many times? Once, twice? I advanced twice, got into the semifinals. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. really think, hey, I'm going someplace, or do you have a good feeling about when it? When I got to the semifinals, I was like, wow. It's like First, I was like, oh, I can really win this thing. And then I started thinking I had the perfect trick. And... They were fighting me on it. They fought me on a lot of things, you really? know, as far as what I wanted to do. They always wanted me to go bigger, bigger, bigger. And I had an idea to do a card trick. Yeah. And it was a personal card trick about my father. And they they fought me on this. They said, no, it won't work. It's too small. And then the next season, everybody's doing card tricks and everybody's at yeah. the table. And all the things I told them would work, they didn't trust me. They didn't believe me. They said, no, it's got to be big. You know, and I guess it was just ahead of my time. And that was the one. Because you wanted to do that, and you did something else that you weren't as comfortable, and, and yeah. that was the one that killed you. Yeah, well, I got through, but I just did you know, the competition. I actually lost a, to a dog act. I hate that. <laughs> I, I'm not, yeah, yeah. Well, there was one dog act went on and won. Yeah, one that's, year. That was, was that the year? That was the year I was on. Well, yeah. that's not bad if you get beat yeah. out by somebody who won. Yeah, that's what uh, comic Tom Cotter talks about it all the time. He's like, yeah, we got beat by dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. I recall Kevin James talking about that, where he had some illusion that he was wanting to do, mm -hmm. and they said, no, we want you to do this other one. And he, and the one they wanted him to do, he ended up getting voted off the island or whatever at that point. Yeah. If he would have done what he wanted, he thinks he would have had a better shot at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I luckily had been on the show the year before with Scott as a mm -hmm. consultant and assistant, so I knew how the show worked. So when I went on... I knew to stick to my guns because I was first around. I did the dancing handkerchief and they told me no. And I said, well, why not? I said, this is a trick that, that you brought me in for. Right. And they said, well, we brought you in for this, but we want you to do something bigger. And I was like, well, I got two weeks and this is all I got this or I can't do the show. And they yeah. said, all right, well, you can do that. And then they really made it look good. But it was because I stuck to my guns. And right. didn't let them talk me out of it. So contractually, they don't necessarily – you don't have to do what they tell you no. to do. So, okay, I just wondered what the contract yeah, they can't, like. They can't tell you what to do with your material. I mean, they suggest. They they strongly, strongly suggest. suggest. Yes, okay. but it's up to you. Well, they can, I guess, make you look bad. Oh, they can make you look like an idiot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, look at Becky Blaney. I was about to say that. They made her look like a bumbling, you know, magician when it was part of her act and, and it Dan was a Stapleton. comedy piece. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, Dan Stapleton, when Dan went on, when they made him look that acting, uh, Mattioli, first time Jay went on, they made him, he's chasing his birds backstage and stuff. And, right. uh, you know, it, they can do it. And that's why you kind of have to play ball a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. Like, because as I recall, I know they also film people because I was – Helping with Masters of Illusion, I know in the audience how they will record beforehand and then put this together with you yelling, applauding, laughing, smiling, or just booing or saying X or yeah. whatever. And so they had overlaid some boos on the, those shows. And I've talked with some people who have been on and said, I went over, I thought, pretty well. But when I saw it, I got a different reaction the way they edited mm. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they couldn't edit me because I did two live performances. Mm -hmm. So because it was live, there's nothing they could do to me. No, nope, that's Thank right. Thank goodness, you know. But the guys who taped, yeah, they can make you look any way they want. Well, now, in, in those tapes, those are the preliminaries, though, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I went on a, a weird thing. It was a YouTube round where they picked people off of YouTube. Oh, that's right, because they'd already reached a certain point, yeah. And then they go. Okay. They went and got the YouTube people, and they picked uh, Rudy Kobe, Eric Buss, and the other one was like, like Dirk Arthur, or, uh, uh, who was the one who has his wife? They both had tigers. They were in like uh, Texas or Branson. Or, they were in Branson. It wasn't um, Rick Thomas, was it? No, it wasn't Rick Thomas. Um, Another one of those guys. Rob Lake. Um, and his wife His wife did magic, too. And, oh, uh, uh, Kirby Van Birch, maybe? Yes, I think okay. it was him. And they, they were the three they picked. Yeah, they didn't Bambi, pick me. Mm -hmm. They didn't pick me. And then all of a sudden, they got a call, and they said they had an issue with the ASPCA or something with the cats. And they was like... Do you want to come on a show? Can you come on in two weeks? I was like, uh, yeah. Okay. I got in by default because I wasn't originally picked. Well, that's interesting. And then I went in and I was with Rudy and Eric, who I knew. So now, when cool. you did move forward, again, you go in with 
with the idea that, hey, I'm getting some good publicity. And then they say, hey, you're going forward. And then you kind of freak out and say, well, what am I going to do next week? Yeah, well, it's just funny. As soon as I got done with the one round and I went to the judgment and they said, oh, a guy going through his pocket. And all of a sudden, before I could even breathe, they grabbed me, pulled me in a room and sat me down with the executive producer. And they were like, all right, what you got next? And Just like that. Just like that. And I gave them the idea to do uh, an ASRO. Mm. And they were like, uh, we don't think it'll work because I guess – Murray had been on and had tried to do an Azra with a train and it and they couldn't vanish they couldn't make it vanish. Mm-hmm. So they were like, No, and I was like, No, 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 trust me, this they get this beautiful video wall, it'll work, let, let me do it. And they said, What else you got? And I said, if I can do it the culted chair, they made me do both illusions, have both illusions set, and then at the end they said, Which one do you want to do? And I got to pick. But I mm-hmm. had to prepare both illusions. And with that, did you have Scott Alexander or other people Scott perhaps? Was, Scott was there with me the whole time. His wife, mm-hmm. Jenny, was with me. My assistant from the cruise ship from L.A., she flew in. So I had my, my little support team with me. That's what I'm often wondering. It seems like after they've gotten to a certain point, because you got in there on your own merit, but then it's like I need to have some other people give me some other ideas to make yeah. sure. Because, I, as you say, you get a lot of input from the producers who are telling you you need to do such and such. And then you can kind of go back and say, well, we need to rework this. Yeah, a lot of these guys use consultants now. They use, like, whether it be <clears throat> Rico De La Vega. I mean, right. they, they, they contract these guys in all the time now to help mm-hmm. get them to the, you know, get them ideas. Yep. Um, and do they have people they call on uh, from the show that say, hey, here are some people? Or do the magicians you know typically have friends? I'm not really sure. I mean, like Danny Garcia is a buddy of mine. I call Danny and say, yeah. man, help me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. I know they bring in a lot of people sometimes. Like if you say, I got a guy. I want to bring him in to help me out. Yeah. But I think sometimes, though, I think the show might also have their own consultants that they bring in. Like I know for myself. They had a guy that had consulted for Copperfield, hmm. and he gave me all these ideas. He's the one who came up with an idea to make the Azra vanish, and it was beautiful, mm-hmm. something I never thought of. Hmm. And he worked out a thing for the crystal casket for us and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, they had some really, really good people on their team at that show. Now, talk about television still. You said on, on Penn and Teller, in that case, you go to them with an idea, and then at that point when you were on i think john thompson was still alive is that right yeah Johnny okay. was there. and then mike close of course is working over there yeah so do you do that then before them and they say eh, that might work or might not you need to work you work that or what was your experience they there? um they basically said send in some videos and they liked this one video and it says can you just bring that illusion and we came in with that illusion we did a run through for johnny and uh and mike and uh some of the producers and then we went on and just did it live. Mm-hmm. They run through and they did it live. And that show was great. They treat people like, like you know, you're doing them a favor, not like the other shows where they treat you like, you know. Yeah. So they treat you more doing, like royalty because yes. it's, it's about magic and magicians. They respect yeah. you for what Damn. you're doing. I've never, I mean, I mean, it was so good, like, to the point where I had to go home to my kids because my kids, I needed to be home. Mm-hmm. And they said, no problem. So they had me tape early. And as soon as I got done, makeup and everything they put me in a limo and gave me wipes and everything to clean up and change clothes on the way and it took me right to the airport it's like wow my plan to get home to my kids on time yeah wow wow that's amazing i, I in the end did you fool them or not <laughs> we scared them okay <laughs> scott scared the hell out of out of pen he jumped out of his seat about four feet and he said you scared the living jesus out of me and that's hard to do because i'm an atheist <laughs> Yeah, but now the the illusion we actually did for them was offered to them by Steinmeier before um, before they saw us do it. But oh. we but we had a twist on it that they couldn't figure out. And it took them a long time to figure out the, the the twist. But yeah, they got it in the end. Had you won, would a trophy have been given to both you guys? Yeah, I believe. Is that so. how that works? Yeah, I, I think just wonder so. if you've got like two magicians, if or as a yeah, because we're not in the same household. It's not like we're right. yeah. I think they would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I, are you, have you ever thought about going back? I mean, since it was a good experience, or have you got some more something um, else to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they'll have me back, yeah, definitely. I'll definitely mm-hmm. go back. Has Scott <laughs> talked about go, going on his own or something? He's got a lot of uh, different ideas. Yeah, I mean, uh, every year. I mean, and when at first, at first, when they started to do um, repeat people, yeah, we tried to go back, and I guess that you know they had so many other people submitting that we weren't top on their list. So, well, a lot of times they want to have someone who's already 
defeated them basically yes. it's like okay try it again see if you like paul gertner for an example oh my or something. Gosh, yeah it comes a challenge thing <laughs> yeah. yes yeah. yes yes as opposed to somebody's like well you didn't get us the first time so why should we bring you back another time you know to uh, yeah. to try to fool us nope you didn't do it a second time either so yeah <laughs> but it's a great show it is a good show i think yeah. it does uh, a lot of good for magic and magicians um now puck i one of the things we talked about before we got started and i kind of want to get into this a little bit and that is your name puck uh, which malcolm puckering but puck is your nickname yes uh, uh, which is obviously just short for for puckering. Um, it, what nationality is it? What is puckering? My uh, my father's from Barbados, <clears throat> and it's uh, British West Indies. And puckering, actually, they call it puckering. There was no G in Barbados when oh. they came up to America. They added the G, okay, to become puckering. But it's an English name. Mm-hmm. And uh, my family had a travel club when we were younger called Puck's Travel Club because Puck was always a nickname. Mm-hmm. I had Uncle Puck's. My brother was Big Puck. I was Little Puck, you know. Yeah. So it was always a name that was given to me by friends. And when I became a magician and I, I, and I took that name Puck as a stage name, it was weird because people would say, hey, Puck, how you doing? I'm like, you don't know me that well. <laughs> you know, it always felt like, my, you call me Malcolm. You don't know me that well. Yeah. You know, so I always felt weird, and now I'm used to it. Everybody just calls me Puck. But. Which, by the way, Puck was all a uh, Shakespearean uh, Shakespeare character. Oh, who yeah, was Midsummer's Night. A Midsummer's, and he was kind of an impish character. Yeah, he was a he? mischievous little sprite. Right. So that's what I thought of whenever, when I first heard of Puck. I thought, okay, he's taking the name from Shakespeare, but that's yeah. not necessarily the case. But do you see yourself as a mischievous sprite or uh, not really? That's, you don't take that character on stage. No. No, definitely not on stage. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as we were talking about with uh, Max Maven. Oh yeah, yeah. Max was. Well, he asked me. I said, you know, is, is my real name Puck? And I explained the whole thing to him. Yeah. And he said it was very similar to him because he said that the best way to prove to him that you don't know him is to call him Phil. Yeah. You know, yeah. he says everybody says he said his, his family calls him Max. You know? Right. Well, it's like with Banachek as well. Once he went to Banachek, and some people think, okay, well, I remember him with Steve Shaw. Well, yeah, and they think they're cool because they're calling him yeah. Steve <laughs> and it's the same kind of a thing it's even yeah. I, I mean it was a business partner and best friend i call him banachek yeah uh, i think that john thompson was the first one to start calling banny i always thought that was funny <laughs> short yeah. name now people call me malcolm now i'm like huh <laughs> <laughs> you're not used to that yeah yes. i understand uh well like with uh, lance burton that was one of the uh, things that was in the contest about what is lance's middle name yeah. And for those who are, have listened this far into the podcast, <laughs> as I understand it, Lance is his middle name. His first name is William. Ah. William Lance Burton. Yeah, I'm going to put that on my questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> you might win something. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, uh, it's been delightful. I've had a lot of fun uh, getting to know you a lot better. And this has been fun. So uh, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word Podcast. What is it that influences you or is your philosophy of life, that your chi? What is it that drives you? Wow. Yeah. Um, now it's time for the heavy stuff. <laughs> no, just, I mean, I just try not to take anything. Try Definitely try not to take anything too serious. Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of times people, when they see an entertainer, they put you on a certain level. But then, you know, if you let that get to your head, you know, at the end of the day, we're magicians. We, you know? Yeah, you don't want to have your head too big. You can't get in the door. Yeah, <laughs> we're a step away from your mind. And- <laughs> exactly. Yeah, hopefully a, a, a big step up. Yeah, it's trying to just try not to take anything too serious because, you know, life is really, really short. Mm-hmm. And you're loving life. Yes. That's great. Yes. Well, good luck to you. Congratulations on what you've uh, achieved and look forward to seeing more stuff that you're going to be doing. I appreciate it's it. great. <laughs> so for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Puck. This is Scotty out. Well, that was great. Thanks a lot, Puck. It was really great getting to know you. And also, I assume the rest of you listeners have gotten a lot out of that as well. So now you know Puck as well. So thank you again for listening to this week's episode and for subscribing to our pod letter. And wait, what? You don't subscribe to the pod letter? We have over a thousand people who have already subscribed. There are thousands more who have not yet. And that means you. If you have not yet signed up for the pod letter, please go to themagicwordpodcast.com and you will see a place there where you can subscribe to our weekly pod letter to find out who's going to be on this week, who's coming up next week, some suggestions from the archives, and perhaps a few other little tidbits of information that you might like to know, particularly like when we have contests. Our subscribers are the first ones to know about these kinds of contests. Please go and subscribe to our pod letter. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember, don't take anything too seriously because life is really short. This is Scotty out. Scotty out.